Good morning, church family. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open it with me to Revelation chapter 2. As we continue our series, Seven Letters, we're looking at the letters that were written to the churches of Asia Minor. And today we look at the second letter that was written to the church at Smyrna. Smyrna, that unimpressive church, full of suffering, full of anguish, impoverished, but used of God. This morning, I want to challenge our hearts and minds on how God defines success. If we are not careful, we will allow worldly metrics to define spiritual success. If we are not vigilant, we will look to man-made methods, corporate business strategies, and secular measures for spiritual guidance. If we are not watchful, we will replace the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the Gospel of God for games, for gadgets, for gizmos. The way that God defines success is different from the way that the world defines success. Christianity uses a different language. The world speaks of success in terms of achievement and bravado and strength. But God speaks of success in terms of humility, and faithfulness, lowliness, and gentleness. You see, Christianity operates off of a different currency. You see, if we are more concerned about budgets and buildings and bodies, then we are missions, ministry, and disciple-making. We may be counting something, but it's not the currency of the kingdom of God. We cannot be tempted towards the sensational. See, there are those today that think that if it's, if it's bigger, then it's better. That if it's growing, that it must be good. Cancer can grow, but it's not good. See, what God will say to us today is that which is small is not unimportant. Our culture has conditioned us to believe that. What is easy is not always right, and what is difficult is not always wrong. Revelation chapter 2, I'll begin reading in verse 8. The Bible says, Write to the angel, that is the pastor, of the church in Smyrna. Thus says the first and the last, the one who was dead and came to life. I know your affliction and poverty, but you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Don't be afraid about what you are about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you, and you will experience affliction for ten days. Be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. And the one who conquers will never be harmed by the second death. The Roman government has banished the Apostle John to the island of Patmos. John is the last living disciple, that he has been exiled because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He's on a secluded island in isolation, but he is not alone. The living Lord Jesus comes to him and says, I want you to write seven letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Last week, we looked at the church of Ephesus. 
And the Lord Jesus, through the Apostle John, says that you have left your first love. Yes, I can commend you because of your beliefs and behaviors, but you have abandoned, you have forsaken the love that you had at first. But today we move 35 miles north to a place called Smyrna. Now there are many exegetical questions that we have when reading the seven churches of Asia Minor. I do not believe that as some have said that this refers to seven epics of church history. I believe these are congregations that the living Lord Jesus speaks to individually. And yes, the council to some of those congregations can be more applicable to us in certain times than others. But to the church at Smyrna, that we are told that they are a suffering church, they are impoverished, but the Lord Jesus had a plan for them. See, there's several things that you need to know about Smyrna. First of all, that this was a beautiful city. Modern day Izmir in Turkey. This was a seafaring port that the Romans had turned into a commercial hub. That the hills of Asia Minor overlook this beautiful sea port. In fact, the name Smyrna speaks to a perfume. That's how the city got its name. It was created by the crushing of fruits from a thorn bush. And what an apt analogy for this congregation. That they were crushed because of their persecution under Domitian. And yet that they let off a beautiful fragrance of Christ. They were crushed and they were abandoned, but yet they continued to have the aroma of Christ. This was also a city that was known for their wealth. But the Apostle John says that they were persecuted, afflicted, and full of poverty. There's an inextricable link there because in that day for you to be poor must have meant that you had a great commitment to Christ. Uh, here were those who had lost their jobs and they'd been pushed out of public office and they had been disenfranchised because of their commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. But we find within this city a church. This church was relatively unimpressive by today's standards. As I told you last week, that five out of the seven letters... The churches of Asia Minor follow a basic template. There is commendation, but then there's complaint. There's condemnation, and then there is correction. There were only two churches that the Lord Jesus did not rebuke. Smyrna and Philadelphia. Smyrna was known for their suffering, for their poverty, that they were a small congregation. And yet the Lord does not rebuke them. No, you have the churches of Sardis and Laodicea that were confident, impressive, and rich. And yet the Lord condemns them greatly. I believe that there is a word for us this morning. That just because you are a large church does not mean that you are faithful. Neither does it mean that if you're a small church that you're vibrant. But we must not measure... The church's success by worldly metrics. God is not impressed by the size of a church. God is impressed with the size of God in a church. So what does that church believe about God? Philadelphia was a church that was committed to missions, and Smyrna was a suffering church. And if this tells us anything about the heart of God, it's that God loves churches that persevere, that even if they are full of suffering, that they continue to carry the commission and the good news of Jesus Christ. And John, through the Lord Jesus, says these words, I know. The picture is of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's walking among his churches, he's surveying, he's studying his churches. We said last week, it's more important what God sees in a church than it is what we see in a church. Is God impressed with what he sees in our church? It doesn't matter what others believe, what the media or the masses. It matters what the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, sees in a church. 
And he begins and he says, I know your affliction and poverty. The first thing that we see is this church was known for their persecution, the persecution that they endured. And persecution came from two sources. The first agent of persecution was to be expected. It was from the Roman government. Christians in that day would not bow a knee to Caesar because Caesar is not Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ is Lord. But we learn about Smyrna that they gave great allegiance to Rome. Decades before that Smyrna was in a bidding competition with seven or eight cities for the loyalty of Rome. And Rome them gave them the benefit. Rome rewarded them for their allegiance. And so the people of Smyrna built a temple called De Aroma. It means the spirit of Rome. This was in honor of Tiberius. And the legend has it that within the pantheon of that temple, there was an emblem that said, Caesar, the Son of God, King of kings, and Lord of lords. And the Christians, they would not bow down to the temple of De Aroma. In fact, church history goes on to say that some of the Roman government came to the Christians and they said, we'll put a statue of Jesus in the temple. And they said, absolutely not, because Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords and the only Son of God. The people of Smyrna, they were not ridiculed and persecuted just because of the name of Jesus. They were persecuted because of the exclusivity of Jesus, that Jesus is the only way. Church family, there will be great pressure in the coming days because of our allegiance to the exclusivity of the gospel. The word for affliction here is the word pressure. Insurmountable pressure, a continuing weight. The idea is that there is a weight that is crushing. A Christian will only thrive in the world today if they are dead to the approval of this world. If we set ourselves in the same direction as the cultural winds, and that we ignore the hard sayings of Jesus and Paul, we need not to fear persecution. But if we stand on the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, it may be time to take out this letter to Smyrna and dust it off, because we could face persecution in the coming days. So often we bypass this letter we say that it doesn't have much relevance to us. Maybe we look to the church at Laodicea, you are neither hot or cold, or we look to the church of Ephesus that you've left your first love. Because we have been surrounded by religious liberty and security and protection in the West. But it's becoming more and more evitable day by day in the mistreatment of Christians and persecution and affliction, that that day could be coming where we see persecution in this land. Persecution could be coming. Affliction could be coming. You will be tested because of your faith. The good news is greater is he that is within you than in he is within the world. If we will stay strong on the word of God, not compromising scripture, not conforming to the patterns of this world, not getting out of the race and quitting on Jesus, but if we will set our eyes on Jesus, he will see us through even in the midst of persecution. But that wasn't the only persecution that they faced from the Romans. The second form of persecution came from an unlikely source. That source was from the God-fearing community, the Jews. Notice what the Bible says here. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. As a pastor, I can tell you one of the most disheartening and hurting things in ministry is when those that you know closest turn on you. That church member, a deacon, or staff member. 
It's one thing when it's the outside world, but when it's from the God-fearing community, it hurts the worst. That person who is the Demas to your Timothy, the David to your Absalom, the John Mark to your Paul, the person that has the same basic belief system that you do. They hold to the same values, but they allow the old flesh to rise up within them. The reason that we do not experience revival in our churches today does not have anything to do with the cultural chaos around us, but rather it's with the old flesh within us and as a church, our unwillingness to deal with it. And so often that persecution can come from within. But we must be careful what we mean by the people of God because we are people of God because of the Spirit of God that Makes us born again. Let me give you a, an example. Several years ago, I was in Colorado Springs preaching at a church, Riverside Baptist in Denver, Colorado. And uh, as we were on this trip, we, we went out to uh, Denver and, and to the surrounding areas, and we were sharing the good news of Jesus. And I met a man um, who was Arabic, and I shared with him the good news of Jesus and he said, I want nothing to do with Christianity. I said, why is that? Just a few years earlier, if you remember the Aurora, Colorado shootings with James Holmes, and he said, I just don't understand how a Christian could do such heinous acts. And I said, well, well tell me more. And he was like, well, that man was an American, therefore he must be a Christian. Because he's not a Jew and he's not Muslim, therefore he must be a Christian. And he made the mistake that so many people make in our culture today. Listen, being born in America makes you no more a Christian than parking in a garage makes you a car. Going to church makes you no more of a Christian than eating in McDonald's makes you a Happy Meal. What makes somebody a Christian is that they are born again by the Spirit of God, and we must be careful what we mean by the people of God. Those who are the people of God are those who have repented of their sins and trusted Christ in faith, and the Spirit of God does a work in our heart, and therefore we are the people of God. See, these Jews, by ethnicity, they were not born-again believers by new birth. And he says here that you have much persecution. Do you feel the pressure today? There may be some of you that feel the pressure. That there are 10 days or so left in the month, and you have no money to pay your bills. Or maybe you feel the pressure because... Your boss is asking for a greater quota and that there are those who are younger that have come into the organization and they can work twice as hard as you and twice less pay. And so you feel the burden, the pressure. Or maybe there are some of you that felt the, the family pressures today, but God is saying to us today, there are those who are afflicted, those who are persecuted. But the persecution of Smyrna was of conforming to the world and compromising the doctrine of Christ. But notice what it also says here. Not only their persecution, but their poverty. They were impoverished. Now in the New Testament, there are two types of poverty. One word is that you are scraping and clawing and that you are managing the funds that you have. You're barely getting by. That's not the word that is used here. The word that's used for impoverished is that you are bankrupt, that you have nothing, the spoil of your finances, the destitution of your resources. He says that you are impoverished. As we've said, that there is a reason for them being impoverished because Smyrna was a very rich city. So the only reason that someone would have been poor was because they accepted a new Christian ethic. That they held to the standard of the word of God and that they were maligned and pushed out. They were impoverished. I think there's a word for us today. That following Jesus 
will cost you something. So often we speak of Christianity in terms of what it does for you, the benefit of you. That's the way we've described it in the Western world. But being a follower of Christ will cost you something. It may cost you popularity or prestige. It may even cost you a business deal. But I would rather have Jesus on my side and spurn the world than spurn Jesus and have the world on my side. They were impoverished, but it then goes on to say that I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. You see, these people were persecuted. They were impoverished, but they were spiritually rich. There are many today who are rolling in their finances, doing quite well, but they are bankrupt spiritually. We see churches today that are full of wealth, but at the same time they are weak. There are Christians today who, yes, they may not be in poverty, but they are poor and power. I would rather have nothing and live for something than to have something and not have anything to live for. What's most important is what we have to live with. There are people today who have much to live with, but not much to live for. The early church, listen to this church family, the early church, they did much with little, but the modern church does little with much. What was the secret to the early church's success? They had one resource for which the world could not comprehend, and that was the Holy Spirit. We have removed the greatest resource that we have in the church, and that's dependence on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not just a resource for the church. The Holy Spirit is the resource for the church. When was the last time that we depended on the Spirit of God for all things? You know, it's the Spirit of God that brings unity to, within the church. So many people today falsely believe that, well, I'll just be a unifier. We should seek unity. No, the scriptures say that we are to maintain the peace in the bond of the Spirit. As Christians, we seek truth. The Spirit of God brings unity. Now, that doesn't mean that we're to be jerks or not kind. But true unity comes from the Spirit of God. If we want to see unity, we depend on the Spirit of God as we seek truth. If we want to see the Spirit of God move, we've got to get back to dependence on Him for all things. Not focusing on our machinery or our mechanisms or our methods in ministry. The Holy Spirit, He is our method for ministry. So here they were persecuted, impoverished, Spiritually, though they were rich, the Lord then has two commands for them. Look here at verse 10. He says, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison to test you, and you will experience affliction for 10 days. Now, that term 10 days could be very literal, a literal 10 days. It could refer to a finite period of time. But as we've discovered from church history, more than likely this reference to ten goes back to the Roman gladiators. As you know, many of Christians were thrown into the Roman arenas, the Colosseums, where they would be eaten and devoured by wild animals. And often, those Christians were held for ten days before they were thrown to the wolves, so to speak. Tertullian reminded us that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. For 10 days that Christians, they were to wait that persecution that they knew was coming that likely would have resulted in death. But John, to the churches there in Asia Minor, specifically to Smyrna, he says, do not 
be afraid. The sting of suffering is so often the fear of suffering. So many people today, they fear suffering and affliction. Maybe that for a while now, you've wondered, God, why are you out to get me? God, you must hate me because there's suffering in my life. But I think that there are others who they're maybe afraid to pray for the blessings of God because your life has been full of goodness and you've had relatively easy in life and you think, well, I'm not going to pray for blessings because then God might turn off the blessing machine over here and maybe I will be the recipient of suffering. And you have both extremes, but may we be reminded that the conduit for the world receiving Christ is through the suffering of the saints. That it's through our weakness that the world sees the power of God. That the faithful suffering of Christ extinguished the powers of hell. And if we, who are followers of Christ, if we have received such a great reward for what He has done, May we be reminded that we too may go through suffering. But suffering has its purpose. And that purpose is the glory of God. We may suffer. And I'm thankful for religious liberty in our country. And many of us have been the benefactors of religious liberty. But as I study the book of Acts, they didn't pray for religious liberty. They didn't pray for protection. There's nothing wrong with praying for protection or religious liberty. When they were faced with affliction, the one thing that the early church prayed for was boldness, for courage. What is boldness? Boldness is biblical clarity in the face of earthly adversity. Courage is being clear in the face of of fear. Courage is not that you have bravado or a natural personality. Maybe for some of you, you are introverted. No, boldness is in the day that the world wants to silence you, you will not allow the world and the persecution to silence you, but rather you raise your voice to proclaim the goodness of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Satan will try to silence us in many ways. For some, that he will silence us through prosperity. That's what he did with Laodicea. But in some parts of the world, Satan will try to silence us through persecution. But may we roar like lions the gospel of Jesus Christ, not allowing prosperity or poverty or affliction or anything that this world would throw at us, know that we have biblical clarity amidst earthly hostility. He says, do not be afraid. Courage and boldness. But there's one other command that was given to the church at Smyrna. It says, be faithful to the point of death. God cares more about the health of a church than he does the size of a church. And the health of a church is determined by two things our faithfulness to the Word of God, and our mission to the world. He says, be faithful. Not partial obedience, but full faithfulness in the face of adversity. He says that you be faithful morally. Do you know that 1,500 pastors every year are removed from the ministry because of infidelity. We're told that 50% of pastors, their marriages will end in divorce. It's been said that 40% of pastors have engaged in an illicit relationship since the time that they started ministry. Listen, there's an arrow on our backs for those who serve in ministry, and it's not pastors only. It's to church members as well. It's to those who follow the commands of Christ. And he's saying, you be faithful morally. He's also saying, you be faithful doctrinally. Over the next many years, that one of the areas that we will face 
doctrinal persecution is in the area of biblical complementarianism. For those who believe, as the Apostle Paul said, that every person is created equal, but God has given divine and distinct roles. And by the way, there are only two genders. There aren't five genders. There aren't ten genders. And the church will be persecuted over the ethic of sexuality. He's saying, you be faithful. The church is to be doctrinally clear, biblically settled, theologically sound, and not adhering to sub-biblical doctrines and worldly ideologies and false teachings. You can be straight as an arrow theologically, though, and be just as empty spiritually. So what God wants from his churches is that we will be theologically settled, that we won't compromise in the area of theology, but we also will hold fast to love for one another. It's possible that we can be full of both grace and truth. He says, you be faithful to the point of death. We can read this passage from Western eyes and forget that there's persecution all around the world. But God gives a promises that he who endures is faithful. That from the time that Jesus was on this earth to the year 2000, and I'm doing this for numerical sake, we've, we've been told there are 36 billion people. 12 billion have been evangelized, and by the broadest of estimations, this would be very broad and ecumenical, 8 billion of those have come to faith in Jesus Christ. Did you know that there have been 70 million Christians of those 36 billion who were martyred because of their faith? 45 million of those 70 have been martyred in the last century alone. There have been more Christians who have been martyred in the 20th century than the first 19 centuries combined. Many have been martyred by the state. One out of 120 Christians will be murdered. Now we here in the West, because we've been relatively protected, we look at this passage and it's uncommon to hear someone that's martyred or persecuted. You may face persecution such as slandered and some mistreatment, but there are brothers and sisters around the world in Iraq, Iraq and Iran, in Turkey, in China, in North Korea, that when they gather each Lord's Day, they put their life on the line. But he says, be faithful even to the point of death. This body they may kill, but God's truth Abide still, and his kingdom will endure forever. Be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Let anyone who has ears to listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. He says, you will be an overcomer. The church of Smyrna, you may be small, You may be unassuming, you may be relatively weak, but in the eyes of God, you are strong, you are faithful, you are enduring. The church of Smyrna did not allow worldly metrics to define spiritual success, and neither should we. Because even when we go through persecution, we must read Revelation 2 with Revelation 21 eyes. So the book of Revelation can be defined and described in two words. Jesus wins. This reminds me of the story of Nate Saint and Stephen Saint. Many of you know the Alka Five. That the Wadani tribe in the 1960s and 70s were persecuting those who were coming in as missionaries. Many of you know the name of the famous missionary Jim Elliott, who said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. But Nate Saint, there on the waters and the beaches of Ecuador, was killed and beheaded because of his faith. But the story is so 
magnificent and a picture of God's grace because his son, Stephen, would go back to that tribe and he won many to Christ. Minkai, the man who slaughtered his father, he led to Christ and then baptized. And then Stephen, one day later, adopted Minkai into his family to be a grandfather in the place of the man that Minkai had murdered. And this is what Stephen Saint said. So often that we look through the pages of Scripture and we look through it for every good word. But as we get to the end of Scripture, we see that God is faithful and it all makes sense. When we go through trials and persecutions of various kinds, it doesn't make sense. But we don't have the eyes of God, the foreknowledge of God. But God knows more than we. And when we go through persecution and trials of various kinds, God is using that for the advancement of his gospel. So church family, don't allow the devil to speak lies into our ears that maybe because we are not as large as some other congregations that we are not vibrant. But at the same time, may we not look down on other churches who are smaller thinking that we are to be boastful. No, the church that God uses is the church that is full of suffering, afflicted and persecuted, but faithful. And that in the face of fear, gives biblical clarity amidst earthly hostility. If you will bow your head and close your eyes as we move into a time of response. The text of Scripture, the passage of Scripture, it determines how we respond to the Lord Jesus and I believe that today the best way that we can respond to this passage is by asking God to give us biblical clarity in the midst of earthly hostility and adversity. And so I'm going to ask during this hymn of invitation, if you would come with your family and that you would pray here that in the days to come, no matter what may come, maybe it's persecution from an executive order, or perhaps it's a ruling from the Supreme Court, or it's from a judiciary or legislative policy that seeks to malign Christians that we would be biblically clear in the face of earthly hostility. There's power in prayer because there is power in the God to whom we pray. Maybe that you would come and pray here as a family that God would pour out his blessing on America, but that the church of God would be faithful, that we would turn from our sin, that there would be cleansing among us. We can't expect revival out there until there's a cleansing from within. That we would pray that the people of America would repent of their sin. If it happened in Jonah's day, it can happen in our day. We've already seen that God has poured out his mercy on us within the last several weeks by Supreme Court rulings. And God will continue to do that as the people turn from their sin and pray unto God. So would your family come and pray for blessings over America, but that the individuals within America would turn from their sin? Would we pray that we would be clear in the face of adversity? We're going to use this time of invitation as a time of prayer. Maybe this morning you need to come forward during the invitation and receive Christ. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for the forgiveness of sins, 1 Corinthians 15. If you have never received a new life, you can receive that today as you repent, believe, and receive. Maybe this morning you need to be baptized. Maybe this morning you need to join our church family. We invite you to come. God, we pray for biblical clarity doctrinal fidelity in the face of earthly hostility and secular adversity. So good, so God, would you raise up your people to pray, to be filled with boldness and courage. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church family, would you stand as we sing? Would you come as we pray?